Welcome to day two in Math 135. Today we're going to explore the basics of functions. And um, I think sometimes people rush right through the basics and when you get to the more difficult ideas in functions, you're kind of in trouble because you're missing those basic ideas. To start out with a function, um, it helps to first talk about a relation. Now, I know that sounds like psychology class, but in math, a relation is simply a set of ordered pairs. And you know, it kind of makes sense because what we're doing is we're connecting the nine to the nine. And what I like about this particular image is that it shows you how they're related. The arrow even clearly indicates you have a starting and you have an ending place. And so I said here, let's write this relation. And on your handout, if you brought that down out off of uh, Blackboard, you can follow along and do the same thing. As I write this relation, a relation is a set of order pairs, so I open up a, a set. And I would say that's going to be 9 paired with 9. Then I'm going to have 9 paired with 20. I have 75 paired with 2.3. And I have 16 paired with negative 1. Now, as you look at that, it definitely qualifies as a relation because it's simply as a set of order pairs. But some of you might say, oh, she has a big problem. The big problem, of course, is that 9 is kind of double time in here, you know? We got 9 2 time in the 20 with the 9. Now, that simply means that this particular relation would not qualify as a function. And many of you have heard that before, and so you know, hey, this guy is not a function. But you know, there are some very important relations in mathematics that we do still study. So it's not that these are unimportant, it's just that we're going to focus more on a function. So the way I like to define what a function is, is that it's going to be a relation, a set of order pairs, in which no input value is paired with more than one output. Okay? Now, how can we represent this? My definition is that we're talking about ordered pairs. So obviously, it can be simply written as a set. It's a set of ordered pairs. But you know you could also take a set of ordered pairs and put it together onto a graph. And we talked about some basics of graphing in the last lesson, and it gives us this beautiful visual picture. Another way we can represent it is as an equation. A lot of times we use x as our input, and a lot of times we use y as our output. It need not be that way all the time. Now, is the following relation going to be a function? We know as we look at this, and I've even called him f, we see that we have a set of order pairs. And as you look down through there, no first component has two different second components. So he does qualify as a function. Now to show him as other representations, I can plot 1, 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 1, 2, 4, and negative 2, 4. Now technically, that's the entire graph. I mentioned a little bit in the previous lesson about being careful about always connecting the dots. Because if I connect the dots, then that all of a sudden takes my set of five points and would make it be a set of infinite points. So I'm going to leave just my five points showing there. So I've got two of my representations. I have order pairs. I've got a graph, and then the third way was to write an equation. Now this isn't something you're going to do a lot, but as you look at the graph, as you look at the order pairs, does any particular equation jump out at you? 
you might notice that all the y coordinates happen to be the x coordinates squared. So I could say y equals x squared. Now, in the case of working with functions, we sometimes like to use what's called function notation. So let me just mention that real quickly here so that you are um, always using good notation. The f here is the name of the function. That's its whole purpose. I can call it f, I can call it g, I can call it q, z, whatever you like. Of course, the cool people usually start with f. And the parentheses show you what your input variable is going to be. We'll be talking about that guy. And then this other side shows how you get your answer. So for this particular set of ordered pairs, it says if I start with a 1, then what do I do? I square it to get my output of 1. Yeah, that's a good one. Now, if you wanted to be really accurate, this equation somebody might misinterpret and think that I have infinite possibilities here to put in for x. So I could include with this where x is an element of the set uh, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Now, don't fret about that. That's simply one way that I can show I have a finite number of ordered pairs in my set. We don't ordinarily work with them that way. Now, a long time ago, I ran into um, a critter called a function machine. And it didn't dawn on me at first what a wonderful thing that was. But it really is very instructive as to how this kind of mathematical construct works. In the case of this machine, you're going to put something into the machine. Then something is operated on and then there's an answer coming out. Now actually, we have function machines all over our daily lives and so in fact, I made a crazy video to show you of one that I'm sure you have worked with on a regular basis. Go. I heard there's a function machine. What? Third floor cheek. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get, let's get to it. Let's go. Let's go. Look at it. Whoa. Look at it. Okay. Wow. Let's see here. If it's a function, what do we have to be worried about? What we put in has to uh, has okay. fit the machine. Okay. Okay. Let's see what I got. Let's okay. See what I got. Okay. I got a whole bunch of pennies. Let's try pennies. Okay. You think I have 125 of them? Oh, let's hope. <gasps> oh, crap. What happened? Take it. Why? Why do you think? Oh, it didn't fit the function. Okay. Well, okay. let's see here. Hey, I got some money from Uganda. Oh, yeah. Let's try Uganda. Please. Let's try it. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's do it. Oh. Okay, well, that was... Man, it doesn't like Uganda money. I don't understand. How about Jamaica? Okay. Ah. Uh. You're making me mad. That's <laughs> Okay. Well, let's see here. How about quarters? <gasps> oh, it liked that it one. It liked it. Wow, oh! it worked. Now it likes me. Let's see if it comes out. Yes. So, let's yeah. see here. I put in, I got out. <sighs> All right. All right. Wow. Talk? No, I can't. I can't handle that. <laughs> okay. Now, granted, that was pretty bad, but it's an excellent example. Because here's what I love about the pop machine. See, you can't just put anything into that pop machine. And the same thing is true with functions. Now, a word that I probably should have used in the video, but uh, having too much fun there with getting my pop, is the idea of domain. Domain is the set of what I can put into a function. And then range is the set of what comes out of that function. So in the case of the pop machine, the domain is going to be um, 
American coins if you're in the US doing this. It would be quarters and nickels and dimes and dollar bills. Certainly things like $20 bills or pennies cannot go into a pot machine. So they're not in the domain of the function. Now you could also think of something like a copy machine. You put in your original document, you get out a copy, and something was accomplished along the way. Think of that as you work with functions. Now in this particular case, we're going to look at a function machine, and the rule that's given to us is add three to the input. So if I start out with four, I put the four into the machine, what's going to come out? Well, within this fancy function machine, it's going to add three. So I would be bringing out, sorry, I would be bringing out a seven. So four was the domain, the input, seven was a part of the range, it's the output. Well, now I decide I want to run a negative two in. By the way, can I run the negative two in? Is there a problem with adding 3 to negative 2? No. That's okay. So that means negative 2 is in the domain. Now, as I run that negative 2 in, what answer is going to come out of the thing? Negative 2 plus 3, I think, is 1. There we go. Well, then we're going to put 5 in. What are we going to get out? 5 plus 3, we're going to get 8 out. Yeah, you're having a lot of fun with this game, aren't you? I can run a one in. I can keep putting in and putting in and putting in numbers as much as I want. And eventually we get tired of just putting individual numbers in and we say, you know, why don't we just do this once and we'll make a shorthand rule. What if I put in X? What is X? X is anything you want it to be. Okay, so down here at the bottom, we're going to write a shorthand way of saying add three to the input. Because you see, one of the things you find about mathematicians is that they're extremely lazy when it comes to writing. So we find all these shorthand ways of writing things. And you just need to get into the in group and figure this out. So my shorthand way of writing this would be to say y is equal to x plus Three. What's the X representing there? Anything you're putting in. What's the Y representing? Anything that's coming out. And so once my X was 4, once my X was negative 2, it can be anything you like. Now remember, I showed you over here that we can use two different kinds of notation. We can use the Y as that output or we can use the F of X as that output. And if I choose to use the f of x, then I have that. And I've got to tell you, I really like using that function notation because I think it makes it really clear that this is my input. And I think it shows you really clearly then, and this is what I do with my input. Now, just like the pop machine, you want to know what are my possible inputs. And that whole set we call the domain. So you look at your function and you say, well, what kinds of numbers can I take and then to that number add three? Yeah, pretty much all of them. So I can write it in a couple of ways. I can use what's called a script R, which stands for the real numbers. That's all those numbers on that number line. Remember the number line Descartes used last time? I can also show it in what's called interval notation. And in the case of interval notation, we would use an opening parenthesis and say go negative infinity up to positive infinity. And have another open um, parenthesis on the end. Okay. Now, what are possible outputs? That's a set of all the answers coming out. Do you think there's any answers that I can't get? Well, let's ponder this for a second. What if, 
What if I wanted to get out of my function machine, say, 10? What would I put in? 7. What if I wanted to get out 5 and a half? What would I put in? There would be a number, right? If I wanted to get out a pi, well, that's not pretty, but there is a number I could put in to get out a pi. And so, in fact, my range would also be all reals, okay? And my range would also be, there it is, my range would also be negative infinity up to positive infinity, okay? Now, you will find that we don't do ranges a whole lot, just trying to think them. A lot of times, ranges are more easily found from looking at graphs. Okay, well, let's go on to another function machine. In this case, we want to square the input, then multiply by 2, and then subtract 4. Why? I don't know. But there might be some particular reason we would want to do that. And so, you know, anytime you get hung up in math trying to figure out what in the world is going on there, take a number and see what happens to that number. And a lot of times that will help you figure out what to do with a variable. So, for example, if I start out, say, with a, um, what number would you like? Three? Now, as three would go into my function machine, what am I supposed to do with it? I'm supposed to square it. That would give me nine. Then I'm supposed to multiply it by two. Well, that would give me 18. Then I'm supposed to subtract four. That would give me 14, right? So my output then would be 14. Now you might play with this several times until you get comfortable, but then what if I'm gonna put in an X? What's the first thing I'm supposed to do? Well, I'm supposed to square it. That'd be x squared. And then I'm supposed to multiply it by 2. Well, you know, we could put the times 2 on the end, but that wouldn't just be cool, so we'll put it in front. 2 times x squared. And then I'm supposed to subtract 4. Isn't that what would come out? Well then, my shorthand rule, and anytime you're giving, uh, given a rule, you should make sure that you've got a full equation. If you just randomly put 2x squared minus 4, we don't know what you're talking about. But if you say, well, y equals 2x squared minus 4, or f of x is equal to 2x squared minus 4, then I at least have a rough idea of what's going on there. Now, on this particular one, for now, let's just talk about the domain. What are possible inputs? So what you have to ask yourself is, well, are there any numbers that I couldn't square? None that I can think of. Are there any numbers that then after I square them, I can't multiply them by 2? And then subtract 4? There aren't any limitations, and so in fact, my domain would be the same as it was the last time. We could say it's all reals, or write negative infinity to positive infinity. Yeah? Well, here's one that sometimes just drives algebra students crazy. The answer is five. And you're like, what? That's my rule. The answer is 5. Now, you may think that complicates it, but it actually way simplifies it. So, you see, if I grab, let's say, 3, and I put in a 3 into my function machine, what am I going to get out? Well, I'm going to get out a 5. Okay, well then, what if I put in a 17? What do I get out? Five. Well, then what if I want to put in 27.32? What do I get out? Five. So, in essence, what's my shorthand rule? 
Does it even matter what x is? Does it matter what I put in? No. Y is 5. Always and forever, 5. Sometimes when they're real simple, they just drive us totally crazy. Now, what are my possible inputs for this guy? I can actually put anything in. Now, the weird thing is, they all go to the same place. So, in fact, if I was going to write some ordered pairs for this particular function, it might look like this. I could have 5 comma 5. I could have 0 comma 5. I could have 1 comma 5. I could have negative pi comma 5. And I can keep doing that forever and ever and ever. Pick any number you like for the x-coordinate. The y is always 5. So what's my domain set? All of my inputs? All real numbers. <laughs> By the way, that isn't always the case. Now I will ask you to ponder the range in this case. Think for just a second, if the range is the set of all outputs, what am I getting out of this thing? Five. And so in fact, my range is simply the number five. That's it. Okay. Well, one more. Last one. Here's the rule on my function. Take the print. Oh, I lied to you. I've got one more after this. Take the principal square root and then multiply by 841. By the way, what the heck is a principal square root? That term simply means that we're going to take the positive square root only. So we would have, um, say, the square root of 4. You know, you might say, well, that could be 2 or it could be negative 2. We're going to take the positive root only. So we take the principal square root of any of our numbers and then multiply it by 841. Well, let's see here. If I put in x, what am I going to do first? I'm going to square root it. And then after I square root it, I multiply it by 841. Now, you know, this guy's actually interesting a little bit to us now because when you start thinking about domain and you start thinking, well, what can I put in? Well, think for just a second. What is it that I do with my inputs? I'm going to square root them. Are there any numbers that I can't square root? <laughs> now, that's actually a loaded question because in essence, the answer is no. But if I want to get a real answer out, I can only square root 0 and positives. If I take the square root of a negative number, I end up in imaginary numbers. We don't want to go there in our particular uh, functions. So my possible domain in this case is not going to be all reals. We're going to say start with 0 and go up to positive infinity. Now let me take just a second and talk about this interval notation. If you've never seen interval notation before, and I would suspect that most of you probably have, but some of you might not have, what we do is we show a, a section of the number line along with, uh, a section along the number line with an interval. And we either use a bracket squared off bracket or a parenthesis. And this is called open and this is called closed. And the difference is simply whether you're going to include that endpoint or whether you're not going to include that endpoint. And we do the same thing for the end of it. We use a bracket for closed, we use a parenthesis for open. And by the way, it doesn't matter which one you used on the left side, you still have either option over here. So for example, if I wanted to say, take the points from negative 7 up 
two, but not including two. So I'm going to put an open circle on two. I bet you've seen that in a previous class. And I want all those numbers in between. Then the way that I would write that is, I would say bracket negative seven. The reason I'm using the squared off bracket is because that negative seven is included in the interval. And then on the end with the two, I would have to use a parenthesis because the two is not included in there. Okay? Two other quick points. Just because I've seen students make errors in this notation over the years. First off, if you're going to use infinity for one of your ends, use the parenthesis because infinity is a concept you don't get there, so there's not an end point. Don't use the bracket. The other thing is that you should always um, use the alignment of left to right along the number line, thinking the negative's going off to the left, the positive's going off to the right. Because if I come upon this interval um, A to B, I'm going to think on the number line A is to the left of B. Now the reason I'm saying that is if I see something like 5 to negative 2, I'm very confused with that notation because it seems backwards of what I want. If I see negative 2 comma 5, then I know you're starting at negative 2, you're ending at 5, and you're not including either endpoint. Now I know you might be looking at that and saying that looks like an ordered pair. Yes it does. It's a situational thing that you need to make sure that you understand what situation you're in and whether we're talking about order pairs or whether we're talking about intervals, okay? And I don't think it's going to cause you much grief. All right. Now, I did promise you. Last one. Here's my rule. Either add 4 or divide it by 17. Now, how would you like to be in the position of having that handed to you from your boss who's going to get angry if you don't give him or her the correct answer and you don't know what to do with it? Do you realize that this is not a good rule because for any particular input, I'm at a quandary as to what to do. So in fact, this is not a function. You are giving me two possible things to do, two possible outputs for a single input. I'm not okay with that because I don't know where I stand on that. Okay? Well, now that we've got a rough idea of what these things are like, let's use our function notation. And I got to tell you, having taught calculus for years, a lot of times students get up to that level and they don't get what this is really talking about. So please pay very close attention to how we deal with this notation. When I see this F parenthesis 3, that says, go find function F. And you're going to put into it the number 3. And then this whole thing is actually representing the answer, the output. So it says, Go find whatever function f is, plug in the 3, and tell me the answer. That's what all of that notation is saying. Well, we're using the functions that we came up with here just a few minutes ago, although I gave them different names. And so I came on to the next page here, and I found which one of my functions was named f. And by the way, that's one of the nice things about using this function notation. You can refer to more than one function at a time, and you don't have to say, oh, that one. You can actually um, refer to the function by name. Okay? So I come back over here, and I've got this lovely function now. And I wanted to line it up right next to it so that you could really, hopefully, visualize what's going on. This says, if you're going to put x into the f function, here's what you do. Well, what am I going to put in? I'm going to put 3 in. 
And then over here, I'm going to have 3 plus 3. I end up with an answer of 6. So I say f of 3 is equal to 6. And how did I know? Because this function, f, told me exactly what to do. For number 2, I want to find out what k of 4 is. Well, I don't have the k function here, so I need to go find my k function. And here it is. Oh, yeah, it was that one with the square root. All right. So I copy that guy, and I say, all right, let's come over here. And then it says, whatever you plug into the k function, what do I do with it? Well, I'm supposed to take the square root of it and then take that answer times 841, which happens to be my favorite number, just in case you wondered. You can ask me later why. Square root of 4 is 2. So 2 times 841 is 1682. So k of 4 is 1682. All right, well, now I've got the g function, so let's go over, find our g function, copy that guy and bring him back over here. Hmm. Here we go. All right, I need to do g of negative 3. So I'm placing a negative 3 right in there. This guy is a negative 3. Hey, and I hope you know your order of operations. We would square first. We get 9 times 2 is 18. 18 minus 4 is 14. OK? Well, we've got f of negative 17. Well, I already have my f function here, so if I can grab a hold of him, let's bring him over here, and now I want to put a negative 17 in there, and I'm hoping you get the gist of this. I put in that negative 17. When I add 3, I end up with negative 14. Yeah. Boy, this one doesn't look like much fun. H of negative pi? Oh my gosh, I hope the H function's not bad. So I go looking for the H function. Oh, this is a good one to have to do that on. Copy that guy. Let's go back. And I have h of x is equal to 5, which means, you know what? What's my answer? 5. Because there's nothing to do with my input, I simply give the answer a 5. Okay? Well, now we get to number 6, and this is where problems will start to pop up if you're not really grasping what we're trying to do. In 6, we're now being asked to put in kind of a mess as our input. And what I often encourage students to do is really look at this in a, in a broader sense. This is saying f of something is equal to whatever that something is plus 3. So if you can kind of think in a more global sense, I'm trying to put in an x plus 3, whatever it is that's going in, I add 3. So f of x plus 3 would be x plus 3 plus 3, and you could say that's x plus 6. Okay. Now, how about g of 2x? Well, here's my g function, and now I'm supposed to do g of 2x. Okay, that little extra line there, let me move it. Okay. 
I'm supposed to put the 2x into the g function, so I say I would put a 2x in here. Now, it might bother you that I've got a 2x over here, but focus on what this is telling me. This notation says whatever you put in, square it. Okay, so what am I putting in? I'm putting in a 2x. Now, I know that's a little bit ugly, so let's come over here and look at it. g of 2x is going to be 2 times 2x squared minus 4. Yeah? Do you see that I simply replaced input with input? Because if you see that, then it's just a matter of using your good old order of operations here, 2 times 4x squared. That'll be an 8x squared minus 4. Yeah? All right. For number 8, I want to do k of negative 9. Well, I've got a lot of stuff over there, so how about if you guys take a second and find what my k function is? Did you find k? Oh, it's that square root guy, isn't it? Okay, so k of x is... 841 square root of x. Do you see how having the names is handy? When I'm asked to evaluate it, I simply go looking for the function. Okay? And let's see here, what am I supposed to use as my input? You know, this tells me, right here shows me, you're supposed to use as your input negative 9. Okay. K of negative 9. It's 841 times the square root of and then you realize, ooh, there's a problem there, right? The problem is that while the square root of negative 9 does exist, it's not a real number. And when we're working with functions in order to graph them and so forth, we like to stay with real numbers only. So in fact, negative 9 is not in the domain. And we mentioned that when we first looked at this particular function. So I can say negative 9 is not in the domain of k. Please don't make me put it in. I can't. You know, it's kind of like putting the Uganda coin into the pot machine. It's just not going to work. Well, we've got one more. And again, this is just kind of to test if you're really on top of all of our notation and so forth. So we need the f function. And I've kind of made a big mess of it over here. But my f function is simply to add 3. So f of x is x plus 3. Hey, you know what? If you get hung up with x's, I have friends that say, I do great math until you put a letter in there. Well, you could think of this as a star, as a smiley face. I don't care how you think about it, but whatever it is there, it's the same thing here. And I'm asked to find the f of square root of a minus 8. Well, that's going to be square root of a minus 8 plus 3. That's it. Okay. Well, let's recap this and put the basics of functions down here in our minds because you're going to do a lot of work with functions. They're extremely important. Just like what would life be like without a pop machine? Life without functions in math would be a problem. First idea, a function is simply a set of order pairs in which no first component is paired with two different second components. Now, if you have a set of order pairs and it's not a function, that's not the end of the world. We do work with them. But we're going to be focusing a lot on functions. And if I ask you, is this relation a function, this is exactly how you would determine yes or no. Second important idea 
is that a function can be given in three different representations. We can write it as a set of ordered pairs, although sometimes that would be a rather large set. We can write it as an equation, which we did repeatedly. We can illustrate it with a graph. Any of those can be extremely helpful to me. Third idea, domain. And you know, if you love using technology, graphing calculators and so forth, domain is extremely important. Because if you don't know what the domain is, you have no idea where to look for your function. Because that's going to determine your x values. It's going to tell you what you can put into it. So it's the set of all your x coordinates, the set of all of your inputs. And of course, then we've got to talk about our outputs. And that's going to be the range. It's a set of all of our outputs. You can think of that as the second component of your order pair. You can think of it as your y coordinates. And then our very last idea is oh, to find a function value. I may give you a function value. When you need to find it, you simply replace every x. I don't care how many of them happen to be sitting over here on the right side of your function. Keep putting in for that particular input uh, variable, and then simplify what you have. Well, we're going to be doing a lot of work with functions, and I hope you've got a beginning idea here now.